Hello and welcome. Tonight, we're talking about food and supernatural and ghosts and all kinds of good stuff with our guest, Julie Tremaine. So sit back, let's uh, get our, our geeky food fix on, and uh, we're gonna have some good times talking about cookbooks and ghosts and, and all that good stuff. I'm your host, Gail Z. Martin, and I'm gonna have our guest introduce herself. Take it away, Julie. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Tremaine. Um, I am a professional food and travel writer, and I write a lot about weird stuff. So that's, you know, I've written a cookbook about Supernatural. I've written another, a couple other books that we'll talk about as we go. Um, and just lots of fun, fun food oriented. I like to go places and I like to try food and wine there and talk about it. I totally am on board with that. So the way we became acquainted was I, I, found your Supernatural cookbook, and I just was so intrigued by that. So how did you end up writing a cookbook about Supernatural? Well, I was a magazine editor at a local magazine in Rhode Island for a lot of years, for too many years. And what I, basically what I did to cope with stress is I would cook a lot, and I would watch a lot of TV about monsters. So usually Supernatural, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, anything that had vampires or ghosts or monsters was pretty much my jam. That's, I, I know it's weird, but that's, I find it very relaxing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Dean loves his burgers, Sam loves his salads, we, we have Winchester surprise, uh, but <laughs> there's not a lot of really in-depth food mentioned in the series. Where did you find your inspiration? and How did you put the recipes together? Well, so I guess to answer your question about how I got it, um, I actually saw a post in a writer's group about the, there was a press that was looking for a writer for a supernatural cookbook. And I thought, well, those are my two favorite hobbies. So yes, I would love to do that. And I was actually on an airplane when I sent that email. So it was <laughs> literally a wing and a prayer to get this book. And it was my first book I'd ever published. And it was I still can't believe I got to do it. It's incredible. Um, but really what I did when it was time to put together the recipes is I just watched the show again. I just went through all the seasons very quickly. Um, they don't, you know, certainly they don't cook very much. They make a pretty big deal about how no one ever cooked. Winchester Surprise was the only meal that Mary ever cooked for Sam and Dean. Um, but there's a lot of jokes about food and they use, because they don't have homes really, they use diners and restaurants to have a lot of scenes where they're discussing the monsters that they're going to go hunt. Um, so the show built in a lot of humor about that food. There were a lot of times that there was food that you just would, you just would never, would never want to eat, or I mean, maybe you would, but you know, there were things like uh, a pepper jack turducken slammer, which was, it, it was basically like an evil sandwich that was possessing people. Um, so I had to come up with that. I had to come up with uh, the goop. There was one. Um, there's one episode where Castile is uh, trying to evade the Leviathans, I think, and there's a sign on the table for the special, which is uh, "Heart Smart Beer Battered Tempura Tempters," which is <laughs> that's what Biggerson is selling is mm -hmm. uh, Heart Smart Tempura. And the idea was that it was supposed to be they didn't really show the food, but I think it was supposed to be, hey, it's a vegetable, even though it's deep fried, it's still a vegetable, so it's healthy. Um, but I did not go that route. I made them as jalapeno poppers, but they were bacon, cheddar, cream cheese stuffed jalapeno poppers that then had a tempura batter that had beer as the liquid. And so it was like very crispy and very, they puffed right up and they were unbelievably delicious. I'd never made a jalapeno popper in my life, but I'm so glad that I did because they're amazing. <laughs> Well, you know, Cass does make them sandwiches as a gesture of solidarity at one point. I did have to make uh, Cass's peanut butter sandwiches. I did grilled peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, which very good. A very simple twist to make them like unbelievably delicious. How about pie? Because Dean loves his pie. I made pie. I made uh, a scarecrow apple pie. I made a warrant inspired cherry pie. 
um, and I made a pecan pie also. Mm -hmm. But then there were, um, I made one, some, so some of the food was from the show itself that we had seen on episodes. Like there was the one episode where uh, it's like a, it's like a monster parody and Dean is like super excited about these pretzels at this mm -hmm. October fest that they go to. So I do make, they're literally just called big pretzels because that's what Dean calls them. Um, they, so some of it was definitely show inspired, but some of it was character inspired that I just made that I felt like reflected characters. So one of the desserts I made was called Bobby's Boozy Balls because Bobby loves bourbon and he loves saying balls. So I, they were, they're like, uh, they're like no bake bur bourbon balls basically. And so good. They pack a punch. Let me tell you, beware. They do. <laughs> they do. Those are so good and they sneak up on you. Oh, you made those? I have had them and oh. they, yeah, they, they kind of sneak up behind you and wallop you if you're not careful. They sure do. They um, go down like a cookie and then they, yeah. <laughs> they hit you. Yeah. Have them How water. about a pig and a poke? You know, do we have that? Oh yeah. I made pig and a poke, which that was one of the recipes that I was not like so excited about because I don't, sausage is like not one of my favorite foods, but they turned out really, really well. They're just, it's just a pancake with a sausage. It's just like a, it's like a taco, but like a breakfast taco with a pancake and sausage. It's really good. And bacon. That all sounds so good. Were there any other recipes that just kind of surprised you, either that you surprised you in that you came up with them or surprised you that they ended up being better than you thought they'd be? So I'm pretty adventurous with food in general. My two things I don't love are sausage, like I mentioned, and bananas. Bananas are my non-negotiable. I will not. But there were banana pancakes on one episode of the show. So I had to make them. But what I did was I was like, okay, well, how am I going to make a food that I like if I don't like the central food that's in it? Um, but I made, I sort of made a um, banana bread batter for the pancakes and then made a salted caramel sauce to go on top. So it was really, that one came out of nowhere. I loved that one, it was very good. Um, but honestly, Winchester Surprise was the absolute biggest surprise to me. It did not sound good it, at all. And I don't know if you remember on the episode, they don't actually provide a recipe for it. Mm -hmm. but there was a cut scene that made its way to Twitter that had a recipe that was basically one pound of beef, one pound of pork, one pound of cheese. So that's all I had to go on. That was the recipe. And we saw it served in a casserole dish, basically. So I was like, all right, what are we going to do here? So I made, um, it's called a bubble up. It's sort of, it's a twist on a casserole, but it's really like, um, it's like a cheeseburger inspired casserole where you put pieces of biscuit in a pan and then, mm. and then you, I, it was ground pork, ground beef. And then I added like cheeseburger components. Like there was onion in there, there was ketchup and mustard, lots of cheese. Um, and then baked it all together. And it honestly was unbelievably good. I was so happy. And I was, everyone I made try it, we were all like, I, we don't know about this. We're, we're a little freaked out. It's called Winchester Surprise. And we all ate it and we were like, this is insane. This is very good. So that was really the biggest surprise of the whole book for me was <laughs> Winchester Surprise. Oh, that just, you know, that all sounds like so much fun because for those of us who really love a show, it's fun to experience it in different ways. And, and I think watching the show for food inspiration is a really interesting theme for a rewatch. Yeah, for sure. And I think that if you're watching it for food, you'll realize how much of the humor is centered on food. Like how many times they just lampoon Dean for having to eat healthy food. Like when he has the, the mark of Cain and he's, he's trying to eat healthy because he's trying to like not give in to his evil impulses that poor man is trying to choke down a green smoothie and it is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Well, that and, and the running joke about how big a sandwich he'll shove in his mouth that mm -hmm. even gets taken to cartoon phase in Scooby Natural. Did you, did you throw in one of those monster, they used to call them Dagwood sandwiches, but now we call them Dean sandwiches. Uh, there is a, there's a, Dean inspired breakfast burger for sure that has um it has bacon and sort of like a spicy aioli and a fried egg on it um there's Dean's kale pita wrap when he is sitting in a car and trying to surveil some some monster I can't remember which one um 
but he's he's just looking at it and like does not want to eat it um there's definitely there's lots and lots of dean inspired stuff there's uh an italian sub with jalapeno peppers from when the episode with the um, the cursed coin mm -hmm. um but there's as the counterpart to that there's actually a lot of really healthy food in the book because mm -hmm. sam eats healthy almost all the time and he's constantly well dean's constantly making fun of him for eating salads and you know the salad comes down on the table and he's like i didn't order that that's not mine so um lots of healthy stuff for him too like there are there are green smoothies there's lots of really good salads there's one time at biggerson's actually in the uh pepper jack turduck and slammer episode where bobby actually orders a salad and dean makes one of them both so bobby's chinese chicken salad is in there too how about kale because we we know that in an alternative universe sam says you know i mean kale god bless kale am i right so <laughs> Yeah, um, so there's kale in the there's in the green smoothie recipe, and then there's also the kale pita wrap. And there's actually there's also a veggie burger, but that one is much more Sam inspired than it is for Dean. Very good, very good. No, I, I love the the creativity, I love the character inspiration, the show inspiration. Now I'm gonna have to do another rewatch and watch it for food because you know there's there's no wrong reason to have another run at Supernatural. But you've also done an article that went in depth on eating like a Gilmore girl. And of course we know that before he was Sam Winchester, Jared Padalec, he was Dean in the Gilmore Girls, Dean Forrester. So um, where did that inspiration come from and, and what does it mean to eat like a Gilmore girl? Uh, eating like a Gilmore girl is basically spending a week trying not to die. So it was, uh, if you've seen the show, you know that there is very, very little healthy food. They will, you know, on movie nights, it's 400 kinds of candy and they need pizza and they need whatever takeout is happening at Al's Pancake World that night because, you know, one food group is not enough for them for any given movie. Um, so it was a lot of that. It was a, it was a lot of, okay, let's have a movie night and have six kinds of potato chips. And they, I actually found something that was like, quadruple stuffed Oreos that had just come out. And I was like, well, that's a Lorelei joint right there. I'm going to have to get those. Um, so lots and lots of junk food. But then I did add a little bit, you know, the, the show has a lot more than just Lorelei and Rory eating junk food. You know, Suki is a gourmet chef. So there's some Suki inspiration in there. There was, I did do a Friday night dinner. I went out to a really nice restaurant and had just a delicious steak and a glass of really good wine because that seemed, I actually pulled it right from the episode where Lorelai and Emily go to the spa and they escape from the spa to go have a steak dinner because they don't want to eat any more tofu. Um, so I did not eat any tofu, but I did eat a really good steak. Uh, but honestly, like, I, the reason I wanted to do it is because they, you know, that's like the running joke is like, how do they possibly eat like that and look the way they do and have energy and not break out? Um, so I tried it for a week and I will tell you, I did not feel very good. I, my, my guts did not feel great. I was, I really felt like, I just felt like I had poison in my body. Like I, you know, I love a cookie once in a while, but I like, I think there was, I ate pizza four times in two days. You know, it's funny because normally in a normal year when we don't have all the stuff going on that we have in 2020, I do about 14 to 17 genre conventions a year. And that means I'm running between panels and that usually leaves me with bar food and, you know, hotel quick service. And I, I have to say that while I miss my friends and I miss the genre conventions, I haven't really missed the bar food all that much. <laughs> I like it. Like, yeah, yeah. I love the taste. Yeah. One meal of it is great, but like I was every morning it was, pop tarts in the morning and then a mid morning snack of oreos and then oh, like some kind of like frozen something for lunch and then like because i was eating a ton of food i but i was always hungry because what i was eating was so nutrient poor so mm -hmm. was, you know in the afternoon i was like all right we'll have some chips or like whatever whatever thing i actually went on a week long quest to find mallow mars i could not find them anywhere and like, even, I guess they're seasonal. They're only in the warm weather months or no, in the cold weather months, because in the, when they first came out, there wasn't good refrigeration. So they would melt. Um, but I, it was in the season for it. I, like I was doing this diet in 
March, I think. So it was still technically Malomar season, but they just weren't anywhere. I went to like six grocery stores. I was calling places. I was Googling, could not find it. Eventually they, my Malomars came in. I broke down and ordered them from Amazon. I got one box for $10. It hurt me so much. And then I got them the last day and I was like, these are actually pretty good. And I kept eating them for the next two days afterwards. So even if you're not planning to write a cookbook or an art, or an article with your background in food, does that really influence you or does that jump out to you in pretty much everything you watch? Are you kind of always thinking, wow, he just ate that? Yeah, yeah, especially in college. That was like my biggest way of procrastinating on work is that I would watch movies and whatever they were making in the movie, I would be like, well, I gotta make that now. So I would, you know, stop everything, go to the grocery store, get the stuff to make this cake, and then have friends over, eat the cake, watch the movie again, and then maybe we'll do the work tomorrow. I can see that. I mean, I, I can see if, if food's your thing, people talk about it a lot. It, it's part of the setting. It's part of the, as we mentioned with Sam and Dean, it's part of the character. Um, so I can see that jumping out if that's what you're really attuned to. But now you also do travel writing and you do uh, theme park food and, and travel. Tell me a little more about that because I got to admit, I'm a huge Disney person. <laughs> I for sure have the travel bug. I grew up traveling a lot when I was a kid. Uh, my grandparents were teachers, so they would have the whole summer off and we would just go, we'd get in the camper and just go. So as an adult, I definitely have just continued that spirit of like, I need to I need to go to the next new place. I need to keep exploring. I want to see, I don't like to go to places twice because I'm like, there are too many places in the world to go. So I'm always, I've always got the travel plan. So being grounded for the last six months has not been super easy, but I've definitely found ways to travel, um, especially going to theme parks. Um, this summer, as the theme parks reopened in Florida and other places too, um, I was traveling. I was there as a writer covering, covering opening day for, lots of outlets. Um, and honestly, like, it felt okay. It was, you know, we're definitely flying in the middle of what we're going through right now is like not the greatest feeling, but as long as you're safe and you wear your mask and you use hand sanitizer and you stay distanced from people, like, I ultimately ended up traveling quite a bit and uh, I never got sick. I mean, knock on wood, but I never got sick. And I think it's because I was just so careful about safety precautions. Well, it was interesting because we were actually at Disney World when it closed in March. Oh, interesting. Um, so, and you know, we had booked it a year in advance. At the beginning of the week when we went, it didn't seem like that crazy an idea because there, you know, there hadn't been a lot of cases, especially in Florida. We still weren't sure what we were really dealing with. But, you know, I loaded everybody up with hand sanitizer and, you know, everybody was being really careful with washing their hands. and then, you know, it was the weirdest thing because as nothing in the parks had changed at that point, mm -hmm. um, no masks, no extra sanitizer stations. It was still very much usual, but my Apple watch is going off like every 15 minutes as the Dow plummets and mm -hmm. one thing after another is happening. And it's like, okay, I've got an apocalypse on my smartwatch, but here in the real world, nothing's changed. This is really freaky. And it was a very eerie feeling leaving Epcot on the last night the parks were open. We had no idea when they'd reopen. Mm -hmm. And leaving that park behind you, not knowing when you'd ever be able to come back, and literally <laughs> turning the lights out and walking out. Very, very strange. And, and you know, we've done Disney every year for a couple of decades so we're big Disney fans and that was that was really bizarre so I can imagine it being kind of strange to be there when it opens back up yeah I think when Disney announced that it was closing I think that was the moment for me and for a lot of people when we were just like okay well this is going to be really bad this is if, if it's big enough to shut down Disney Disney World had only closed I think six other times in the history mm -hmm. of the park since 1970 uh, and that's usually for like hurricanes or it was when 9-11 happened like it, it takes like major major events for that to happen so it was very scary and you know it's it's not like the world became all that 
much safer. So when they decided to reopen, I mean, I was, I was really conflicted about it. I know a lot of people were very conflicted about it, especially when Disney World was opening again. It was in the middle of a really bad surge in Florida. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of criticism about why is the park opening? Why aren't they delaying? I got a lot of personal pushback of why would you go? Why would you promote travel? But I didn't really see it as I, I was very careful in my writing to say, like, I am not telling you to go here. I'm not saying that you will be safe here. I'm saying I went, I took a calculated risk. I felt that it, it was important to me to see the first day. And I honestly did feel okay there. I, I felt safer at Disney and at Universal than I do, you know, in the grocery store. People, you know, there's no one forcing you to wear a mask anywhere, but in the theme parks, it's required. You have to, at Universal, they have a person dispensing sanitizer into your hand before you get on the ride. It's uh -huh. you have to clean your hands before you get on. Everywhere you go, you, if you lower your mask to take a, sip, take a sip of water, someone's saying, please put that mask back up. Like they're really, really on it. And I, I, you know, I felt okay. I mean, there's been some things in the news recently about maybe Disney's not being totally forthcoming about their infection rates, but all, all I can say is my personal experience and it was, it was okay. It was scary, but once you got past the scary part, it was okay. Well, you know, there's a lot about travel that isn't guaranteed to be safe, especially depending on the kind of travel you choose to do. A lot of people go in for adventure travel, a lot of people go in for hiking or travel that has very physical aspects of it. And there's, you know, the odds are probably with you that you're going to get home fine, but you know, things happen. So there's, I don't know that there's any kind of travel that's hundred percent guaranteed that, you know, is, is guaranteed to be 100% safe. So yeah, I get it. I do. I agree with you, but I also firmly believe that you should not go anywhere right now without being right. the safest you can possibly be. So if you're, you know, no matter where you're going, like, you got to wear your mask. You got to stay away from people. You have to be super, super careful about whether you feel okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, as soon as I got back from Disney, I got tested immediately because I was like, I, I'm not going to be around anyone until I know for sure that I'm not sick because I just think it's totally irresponsible and unfair to the people in my life and the people I don't know who I, you know, pass in the grocery store. Well, when we came back in March, you know, of course there were no tests. Um, and so kind of sat it out and white knuckled it and said, okay, well, 14 days is up. I guess we're uh, mostly okay. Um, but that was when, when the week ended, it was much scarier than when the week began. And we were actually supposed to go on a Disney, um, Disney cruise and that got canceled. So for the best, but uh, they're very careful there as well. Um, they haven't opened those back up yet, but no, I agree completely. The, the whole, everything now to stay safe is, is a very different layer on travel. But that aside, tell me about your theme park uh, fascination. How long have you been covering Disney and Universal? Let's go back to the good times. <laughs> <laughs> the good times and the times that we'll hopefully be back to again soon. Um, I, I really didn't go to Disney very much. I went once when I was very, very young and then my best friend had a baby and she said, I wanna go to Disney for my daughter's first birthday and I said, okay, that sounds fine. So we just, you know, we, <laughs> you know, what, you know how it is when you're going to Disney, especially if you haven't been a lot where you are just totally consumed by fast passes and dining reservations and planning your park hopping and planning what resort you want to be at. So we, for months, we were just like, okay, here's, where, here's how we're going to strategize. Here's where we're going to move all these pieces around. And it was fun. It was like playing a board game. It, you know, it was mm -hmm. like the scheduling to me was just as fun as being there. So Eventually, we went a few years in a row, and um, eventually we got really good at it. And we became really excited. Like, whenever somebody was saying they were going to Disney, we were like, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're gonna, you have to go to this place. Don't go to that one. Get a fast pass for this ride. Skip that one. So eventually, I started talking about it so much that I was like, I could probably write about this. I think I could probably help people. I, you know, the writing that I do about Disney is definitely not really about planning your trips. It's much more about sort of seasonal events that are happening or like... Mm -hmm. You know, food festivals, stuff, stuff that only happens once in a while at the parks that is, is worth checking out. Um, but it became, you know, it just became really big. It became 
where I, I don't really plan trips to Disney for fun anymore. Now it's always for work, but it's fun. You know, it's a really fun job. It's definitely a lot more fun than any other job I've ever had. So. Yeah, I, I, well, and you know, I've seen the Food and Wine Festival at Disney expand and grow over the years and the Flower and Garden Festival. And then their, their Christmas, you know, extravaganza and Mickey's Not Very Scary Halloween. Uh, what's been fun with us is we've gone over the years with our kids from the time they were toddlers until now they're in their late 20s. They still want to go, but watching how everybody experiences the park differently now and over the years has been really fun because Disney can be whatever you want it to be at whatever stage you are, which is pretty wild for an attraction. Yeah, I agree. And I think that people who haven't been will say, well, that's just for kids, but there's a lot that's not for kids. There's a lot that's specifically not for kids. Mm -hmm. And I just, I enjoy it. I think, you know, people, people criticize and they say it's manufactured happiness. And I say, that's fine. I, you know, there's, I go a lot of places and explore a lot of things outside of theme parks. And I, I love that. I love seeing new things, but I think that there's, I, I, when I walk into the parks, even if it's for work, I just feel this sense of calm and this sense of joy. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to have a really nice day today. And I know that no matter what happens, I'm still in a place I love and I'm going to be really happy. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's definitely part of what you get with the vacation is that um, there's enough new to keep it interesting. There's enough familiar to make it kind of like a comfort food. Mm -hmm. And at every age, you see something, experience something a little differently, which is kind of fun. And, and they do switch stuff up pretty regularly. Yeah. And I like, I like Universal as a counterpart to that mm -hmm. because Universal, I feel like, has... The, Disney has really great thrill rides, but Universal, I feel like that's, they really double down on that. There's a lot of really intense roller coasters oh. there, and Halloween Horror Nights is like one of my absolute favorite things. I'm so sad it's not happening this year, but just like the genuine scares that walking through those haunted houses, it's just, you can't beat it. Yeah. Oh, those are fun. Um, and Universal, you're right. It's a very different experience. Um, I love the Harry Potter worlds, mm. but walking through the rest of the park and experiencing some of those movie rides and, and some of the thrill rides, it's, it's just very different. It's, it's wonderful, but I've always been a theme park junkie anyhow. So now you have a couple other, you have another cookbook coming out and then you've got something completely different. So tell us about the other cookbook. The other cookbook is based on the office and that comes out in the middle of October. So I'm not sure if it will already be out by the time you're watching this. Uh, but it is, it's a, it's not just a cookbook. It's a, it's called the party planners committee, the party planning committee's guide to planning parties. So it's, if you've watched the show, the party planning committee is super important part of the show and they're constantly spending a lot of office time planning events and not working. Uh, so this book is arranged into a lot of different events that you see on the show. So there's a dinner party when Michael and Jen throw their disastrous dinner party. There's a baby shower. There is a, there's a murder mystery party when Michael throws that murder mystery night. Um, so lots of different events and each, each of those events has recipes that for food you were recommended to serve. There are activities and there are crafts for each, for each of the events. So that's a lot of fun. That was, again, I watched a lot of The Office in a very short amount of time to be inspired by that food. Um, but at the same time, at the end of October, I have another book coming out, which has nothing to do with food, but actually tangentially does have to do with Disney. Um, my, <laughs> my friend, uh, Amy Bruni, is a professional ghost hunter. She was on Ghost Hunters for a lot of, a lot of years, and now she's on a show called Kindred Spirits. And she wanted to write a book about her her personal philosophy when it comes to investigating the paranormal, which it's a little bit different than maybe what you've seen on other TV shows. Um, so she really wanted to write a book about it. And I said, well, I know how to write things. I can help you out. So we decided to write it together. And um, we actually were at, a we had planned a weekend at Disney, totally unrelated to working on anything. And it was that weekend that we came up with the book. We figured out what it was gonna be and how we were gonna do it. I remember I had a notebook in my hand 
and I was writing down notes about one of the chapters as we were getting onto the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. And I was, I'm writing, writing, like as it's getting, the boat's going forward and it's getting darker and darker. And I'm just like, oh, I have to get these last few words out. And like right before we hit the drop, I stashed the notebook so it wouldn't get wet as it went down. Oh, that's great. Um, so the book is about doing paranormal research or her adventures as she's been doing it. What's the slant? Uh, both, yes. Okay. So it's it, it's not so much a memoir as it is kind of the what she's learned about paranormal, the paranormal and ghosts over her many years of investigating, um, but also kind of what she feels is what works the best for her, which what she thinks is maybe the best way to approach it, which is to treat ghosts like people. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot of shows, a lot of investigators, even not on shows go into a haunted space to say, oh, I saw a ghost, just to get evidence of having seen something. Uh, but her philosophy is, you know, it's great to see that they're there, but why are they still there? She said that in her, in her career, the two EVPs that, which are called, those are electronic voice phenomena, uh -huh. which are, it's recordings of ghosts. You can't really hear them, but if you're recording the playback, you, they, the recorder picks up more than you can hear. Um, the two EVPs that she's gotten the most are Get Out, which makes sense, and Help Me. And she said that after a lot of years investigating when ghosts were saying help me, she just, it really broke her heart that she couldn't stay to help them more. But because of production schedules or limitations to the places, she really couldn't help them and figure out why they're there or talk to them or find out if there was a message that they wanted to relay and that's why they're sticking around. Um, so that's over the years, it became much more about, I want to talk to these ghosts as people and not just see them as sources of entertainment. So really that's what the book is about, is about you know, wh why she feels that way and what she does to sort of, it, she jokes, she jokingly calls it ghost therapy. It's not, it's not really that. Um, but sort of the way that she talks to them, that's mm -hmm. different and the results that she gets and very, moving experiences, powerful experiences that she's had, but also very scary experiences that she's wow. had. And let me tell you, I was at some of those experiences and they are terrifying. I stayed in a haunted hotel room once at one of her um, paranormal events and furniture moved. And I, I will not say like, I am not, I did not walk into this saying like ghosts are definitely real. I'm much more, I come at it from a journalistic approach of like, okay, I'm gonna observe what I can observe and I'm gonna talk about what I see. And I saw furniture move. And wow. no that room with me. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that story is not in the book, but a lot of Amy's experiences at that same hotel are in the book. Um, it's called Life with the Afterlife, 13 Things I Learned About Ghosts. And it's by Amy Bruni with me, Julie Tremaine. Um, and it comes out at the end of October. And honestly, I cannot wait for people to read it. I think it's I think if, if you're interested in the paranormal, it's going to be a whole new perspective on maybe what you've read already. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. I got to get my hands on that one. That one sounds <laughs> terrific. So you've done a broad variety of writing about travel and food. What are some of your favorites that we haven't talked about so far and what's on your bucket list? God, I'm the, and the bucket list is endless. I feel like every time I cross one thing off of it, uh, there's just 10 more things that go on to it. Um, I was, I've done a lot of cross country road trips. That's really my favorite thing to do is just get in a car and drive. Um, so I, luckily in the last few years, I've really hit most of the places that I, most of the cities I had been intending to visit that I hadn't visited yet, but I would say absolute top of my bucket list for where I want to go next is Chicago. That's, that's one place that I just, I, I generally stick to the coasts. I'm either all East coast or all West coast but I've heard such amazing things about that city and I can't wait to get there. Um, and relatedly, I really, really, really wanna to go to the House on the Rock, which is not too far from Chicago, which is, I'm sure you're familiar with it, from American Gods, which is, I love bizarre roadside attractions. I love, I love places that were popular a long time ago. Like I'm very much like, I, I love nostalgic pop culture. And I think that's part of why I love Disneyland so much is because I walk mm -hmm. in there and I feel like I'm in 1955. Mm -hmm. um, so the house on the rock for sure. Super weird one. I can't wait to see it. Um, honestly, like I had a, I had a failed bucket list item. Um, I went to Sweden in February and we went on a snowmobiling excursion. I, 
was, I've never been that cold in my entire life, but <laughs> I suffered through it because we were supposed to see the Northern lights mm. and the guide said, no, there's not going to be any lights tonight. It's too warm out here. Meanwhile, I'm like, my body's like in a fire trying to thaw my feet out. Like I had, it was at the Arctic Circle. It was very cold, but even in like three layers of like snowmobile gear, it was, I'll, I'll try that again. Like maybe from inside a house at some point, but I don't know if I'm going to be out in the snow, like traversing frozen lakes in Sweden again. Wow. Yeah. That, that would be a disappointment to, to freeze like that and then not even get your Northern lights. Yeah. Well, you know, when you get to Chicago, it's a great city. So all the hype is true. And the food, oh my God, the food. And uh, not just the pizza, but you got to get the Greek stuff and the Greek Italian stuff. And Oh my gosh, you know, it's a great city. But I'm going there in the summer because it, I've heard it's basically Arctic Circle temperatures in the winter time. Yes, yes, with the lake effect. But I mean, hey, even death likes the pizza there. We know that from Supernatural. So <laughs> That's true. That's actually a really good recipe. That was the first time I ever made Chicago style pizza and I was really happy with how it came out. <laughs> oh my gosh. So you've got, you've got those two books coming up. Do you have any big article series coming up or anything that you're working on right now? Yeah, actually I just got hired to be the first ever Disneyland editor for oh. SF Gate, which is part of the San Francisco uh -huh. Festival. Um, so I'm based in LA right now because I want to be as close to the park as possible. It's not open yet, but I feel like it's probably coming soon. Um, but this is, this is my, my main gig from now on is wow. really getting into the history and culture of Disneyland, really talking to people who, you know, I've seen Disneyland is a very different creature from Walt Disney World. It's much, much more about people who live close by and have been going their entire lives. So I've st I saw this one man waiting in line at the cars ride who had, he had this giant lantern of pins on, but the pins were like, I was here opening day of Indiana Jones ride and like, you know, Disney's 20th anniversary in 1975. And like, I talking to people like that about why they're passionate about it is one of the things I'm absolutely thrilled to be doing. Talking about rides that aren't there anymore, really digging into like sort of untold stories. I, my, <laughs> my next thing that I really want to investigate is whether Walt Disney is actually frozen, which <laughs> pretty sure that's not true. Pretty sure I read that it's totally a lie, but I really want to find out where all those rumors came from. I mean, that's uh -huh. like a legendary urban myth. So just to me, the fact that it ever happened is as interesting as whether it's true. Well, and, you know, the whole mystique over the rides that aren't there anymore and the rides that have changed over time and real Disney files will be able to completely recite where the scripts have changed and what's changed and, and when it changed. And, you know, all fandoms have their rabbit holes. And definitely that's, that's one of the ones for Disney files. Yeah, absolutely. Rides that aren't there anymore. And to me, like, there's a lot that Disneyland has that Disney World does not have, but they have a lot of old rides that have been torn down. They still have Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, which is one of my least favorite. But <laughs> I end up going on a lot because the wait time is always so short. Yeah. But um, there's like the Matterhorn, there, you know, things that Disney World has never had, but they also do really interesting holiday things there that don't happen in Florida. They have Haunted Mansion, for example, becomes Nightmare Before Christmas themed for all of the fall. So it's it starts in September, I think, and then it goes through January, where it's every, all the normal stuff is taken down, and it's all like Jack Skellington going through trying to create Christmas in Halloween. Oh wow! Town. It's amazing. The just the visual effects are just stunning. I love it. I love the regular Haunted Mansion more, but it's really nice to get that change. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing happens with It's a Small World. That gets a total holiday makeover. I'm not sure if that happens in Florida. Um, I don't believe it does. The last time we were there at Christmas, and it's been a while, they may have upped their game on it. I don't remember that, but um, it's been a while, as I said. But they, um, it snows in Florida. I mean, in mm -hmm. California. It snows at Universal Studios, and it snows at Disneyland. If you're standing on Main Street, and all of a sudden just 
at the end of the fireworks, just snow comes from all on top of the buildings and it's gingerbread scented and it's definitely not real. I'm pretty sure it's made out of soap, but it is magical. Standing there as the snow falls all around you is just, it's lovely. It really does feel like there's a beautiful sense of holiday warmth that happens when that happens. Oh, that, that sounds fantastic. Now, one of the things they'd introduced in Orlando is the um, projection mapped um, video onto the castle, which, you know, when I first heard of that, I thought, okay, how, how impressive can this be? They're gonna, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen people put a movie on a wall before. That's not this. It was so mind blowing. Yeah. And I know that they do a special one for Halloween, which I'm not going to get to see this year, but um, do they do that with the one in Disneyland as well? Have they, they done the productions? They do. It's been a couple of years since I've been there for holidays, but there's definitely a special show that happens mm -hmm. at night, special like fireworks presentation. And it's, um, it's different. They have, so in California Adventure, they have something called World of Color, which also does not happen in mm -hmm. Uh, which is, so Disney's California Adventure is the counterpart to Disneyland, which that's the part that we would call Magic Kingdom in Florida. That's, it's Disneyland here. Um, but there, it's two parks across a plaza from each other. So you just walk. Park hopping is literally just, you know, walking 400 feet. I mean, it's longer than that. It's a few minutes walk, but it's, they're right across the plaza from each other. It's very easy to get back and forth. So you can see two shows in one night. So California Adventure is California themed. And it's based around this giant lake in the middle of the park. Everything is kind of a loop around that, similar to Epcot. And in the middle, they have all these jets under the water and the jets come up and they spray these like crazy fire and water all over the place, but they project images onto the water when it's in the air. So they have, you know, they'll play like parts of movies and they'll play songs to go with it. And it's just, that is a remarkable experience. I absolutely love world of color it's it's not it doesn't happen all the time it's i think that the that machinery takes a lot of upkeep but when it happens it's it gives you chills not just because you get sprayed by water and it's cold out but <laughs> it gives you real chills too yeah i well and that's what disney is great at providing the show i mean they bring it so they there's nobody who does it better they sure well do. Believe it or not, we are out of time. This has been so much fun. I got to get my hands on that cookbook and, and especially those jalapeno poppers. Um, I mean, I'm hungry now. So, <laughs> uh, and congrats on the two upcoming books. But uh, thank you so much, Julie, for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Oh, this has been great. Um, and I'd, I'd love to get to talk more about that ghost book and, and uh, everything else. So you may be hearing from me again here. But... Uh, <laughs> Tell us, tell everybody where they can find you on social media and give us the names of all of the books, uh, again, so people can look those up. So the Supernatural book is, is called the Official Supernatural Cookbook. It's called it's Burgers, Pies, and Other Treats from the Road. Uh, the Office Cookbook, which comes out this October, is called uh, the Party Planning Committee's Guide to Planning Parties. And then uh, the Ghost Hunting book is called Life with the Afterlife by Amy Bruni and me, Julie Tremaine. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at just my name, at Julie Tremaine. All right, well, thank you very much. And folks, uh, I'm your host, Gail Z. Martin. You can find me at gailzmartin.com. And of course, this is for Continual, so you know where to find us uh, for that. Stay tuned, we're gonna be having a lot more food and fun and fandom here on Continual. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>